this is a day in the life of a CISO with Richard Greenberg. Richard is the CISO for the LA County Department of Public Health. Previous positions include Director of Surveillance and Information Systems, Chief of Security Operations, Director of IT, and Project Manager for various companies and agencies in the private and public sector. Richard is the President of the ISA, ISSA and OWASP Los Angeles Chapters. Richard is running for election to be a Global OWASP board, members, board member and encourages everyone to vote. Please welcome Richard to ShellCon 2018. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Where's the mimosas? So I, th I suspect some people will be floating in soon as they are filling up, which is what I should have done before I agreed to do this. Uh, so thanks for choosing this. Uh, hopefully you'll get some information that might be helpful in your career for you. I suspect uh, it will be. It might not be evident at first, but I'm going to just take you through and uh, give you an idea of what life is like for me. So we step, come with me as we step into the role of a CISO just for a day. Um, a disclaimer, this is my talk, it has nothing to do with my uh, employer. These are things that have happened to me, and these are some things that are theoretical, but as you'll see, you'll probably recognize some of these things that I have to cope with, as you have to probably deal with them as well. So, day starts, emails. How many of you sort through hundreds of emails and crap to find the hidden gem? Right? And if you don't check those emails and say this is all crap, then two days later you'll go, you guys do, didn't you get the email? Well, why didn't you act on this? So this helps quite a bit. Um, so day starts with a conference call. Um, when you're dealing with third party companies, business partners, you've got to make sure you're assessing what they're doing. And it's really important that you've got your a set of security standards and controls and templates that you can then pass over to them to complete. It would be nice if there was a standard. I know the banking community and finance has one, a third party assessment, and if they fill one out, then your company can tap into that and you just accept it. But that's not the role or the way it is for the rest of the world. So uh, I've had to fill out multiple assessments some companies fill out hundreds per year with their different business or company uh, that they partner with. So um, it's important that, that you have this understanding. Uh, we try to follow some standards when we build some stuff, but we customize it because we want to find out about certain things. Where I work in public health, we deal with confidential patient information. So we're uh, regulated by HIPAA, but there's a lot of other regulations. I'll t mention that as we move along. Time to go to work. Bring my daughter with me. Here's my first risk assessment of the day. Will there be more traffic on the freeway or the streets? Uh, how many of you have recognized, I don't know if this is just me dreaming, but it really seems to be the case, when it's overcast, traffic is less in the morning in LA. Okay, so I don't know if anyone has a good explanation, but I could just see the typically millennial waking up, looking out the window, go shit, and rolling back over again, because the sun's not out. Anyway, so, some of the things we have to evaluate. But again, life's filled with risk assessments. Um, Eight o'clock conference call. Uh, I've got to deal with the, my security operations team. Oh, the new cold boot attack. So we've got to take some action. So uh, have them shut down or hibernate, to get rid of the sleep mode. That's not a good approach. And despite some of the resistance from upper management, uh, we're going to require a bit locker pin on boot. So now they're going to have to enter two separate credentials and uh, we get a little hit from uh, some executives who want to do it the easy way but if you've established yourself and gotten credibility and you don't come across as a cop right as a security person that stops things then you'll get people with a little more sympathetic ears and perhaps will listen to some of the things that will cause them a little bit I mean another pin what's that two or three seconds extra to get in or maybe they just never shut their system off right all right, I arrive at the office. I just want to keep that one up there for a minute or two. It wouldn't be nice. Okay. Although we do have a couple of guys from EdgeScan from Ireland, so that's probably home for them. I don't know if it's their office. Um, 8.35, okay, phishing attack. So someone asked me once what's keeping me up at night, and I think phishing attacks are one of the worst because I can spend millions in tools to 
protect our network, layered security. I can assess regularly, I can do audits, but how can I possibly train 5,000 people and expect no one to click that link, especially if it's a joke from their friend, supposedly? It only takes one, right? So this, this, is, this is something that's not going away. Uh, about five years ago, when phishing started to first uh, take on a lot more importance, um, I, didn't, I didn't think that it would be as powerful a tool for the hackers as it is today. But it's so easy, and it's all automated, and they just throw it out there. It's not going away, um, and the implications can be dramatic. So depending on your incident response, your detection, uh, it, it can wreak havoc. So one of the things, the, the scenarios that we deal with you know, are all types of phishing attacks. You've seen them all, right? In the first slide, one of the first slides, I talked about the spam emails you get, right? You, you're getting phished as you're sitting here. Right now, on your phone, you've gotten a few, right? We know that. So what we instruct our users, and we have uh, emails that we send out on a regular basis, informational, we say, if you get something that looks suspicious, don't click on it, and forward it to our help desk as an attachment, not just forward and not just tell us about it in screen print, but we actually need the attachment because we want to look at the header information and to see where it's from, what it is. Um, and then if it's got a payload, then we, we'll check out um, in something like Virus Total. How many of you are aware of Virus Total? Yeah, so basically it's, it's an accumulation of all the different uh, DAT files from all the AV vendors, well, not all, most of them, in one location on the web, and you can throw your, your payload up there and take, they'll let you know if it's malicious. So that is a help. Uh, but also, don't trust the users when you interview them. By the way, interviewing is very important. Right? Don't just respond with an email. Contact them because an email, it's so easy. And any, and if, any of you who have experienced this will know, it's easy to say something, and later on you go, oh, I didn't really mean that. I just typed it really quick. But if you talk to them, the, they might be a little bit more truthful to you. Well, yeah, I, I did click that link. But I didn't, I didn't enter my credentials, but you click the download link, right? Well, yeah, but I didn't enter my credentials, okay. But if you just send them an email, no, I didn't do anything. And we've seen that. So you also have to check the logs, right, to see. So contact your, your folks that, that guard the gateway and ask to see the logs for this person. Um, and quite often, we'll have them just reset their password. Other times, we might have to rebuild their system. It depends. So you've got to be a little diligent, but you have to have a process. I might say this a few times today, procedures are crucial, all right? Everything's got to be in writing. All your operations have to be in writing. It's, most people don't like doing this. So you can hire a technical writer, or you can just do it the hard way and do it yourself. But what I find is very helpful, and maybe some of you do this too, I'm driving in my car to work. I mean, I got a nice, I live in LA, right? So, but my commute isn't too bad compared to many of you probably except for those that work from their home, and I want you to get out of here, and I want to see your face. <laughs> um, but I'll be driving to work, and when I stop at red light, I'll take my phone and dictate stuff into my phone that I'm going to be saving later, right? I find the voice recognition better on my cell phone than on my PC. My desktop, I, I use the Microsoft one. That's a piece of crap. But as I'm driving, at each red light, I'll build up, uh, you know, a couple of paragraphs of info. I'll, of course, I'll have to check it when I get back. But when you get great ideas, you don't write them down or speak them right away. You got something else, some other fire coming, and you don't even remember that. I'm just remembering something now Thursday I didn't do. Right? So it's good to have that instantaneous you know, thing. So that's a recommendation. Think about it. Do it safely. Don't do it while you're driving. Just do it as you're you know, waiting. So um, put in your procedures and make sure that uh, it's implemented. How many of you have had a situation where something happened, and then someone said, oh, let's let's do something. I go, well, Joe's not here today. He's off. Well, doesn't anyone else know how to do this? Well, no. Well, what's, let's see the procedure. Well, we, he knows how to do it, but it's not in writing. Or someone says, okay, rebuild the server. Well, all right, Joe's not here, but all right, I'll do it. Oh, yeah, you forgot to update SQL. Oh, boy. So now you got to unpatch SQL because you didn't follow the procedure specifically. So, uh, some of this is obvious, but it can't hurt to say it again. It's important. Nine o'clock. Okay. 
IAM, this is a bear. Identity and access management is so complex. Uh, some vendors will come and say, oh, we got this great solution for you. But in reality, most companies have multiple apps on different platforms, written in different tool with different um, uh, uh, platforms. And you know, some companies say, we have a solution. We have all these connectors. Uh, but uh, the connectors for some of the apps that are legacy apps will have to be customized. And that's a lot of scratch to do that. So basically what this is about is being able to log in on any system and have a centralized login authority and a record of who has access to what. I mean, if a person leaves, wouldn't it be nice to be able to just hit a button and all their access to everything is gone? So there's no open access to this person. I mean, are they a disgruntled employee? Are they someone who has terrible security etiquette at home and they're hacked? Someone gets their credentials and logs in as them on your system because you didn't shut them down? It happens all the time. So IAM, that's one of the biggest, for me, it's one of the biggest pluses of an IAM system. Plus to make sure you have uh, people approving every single user that wants access to any system, right? Somebody comes in, why are they having access to everything when their role is just this? Or they move from here to here, but they still have the access to the HR database, but now the, their job is totally different. So IAM can help with this. Um, some of the tools that I've looked at, um, look promising, but they fail in reporting. So a lot of these reports that I was talking about that are helpful that I want to run, uh, they don't have. So I won't name names, but um, do, do your diligence. Don't just accept what a vendor tells you because, well, I won't say more on that. It's obvious. Okay, 930, meet with the head of application development. So um, make sure whenever possible, that security and app dev are at the table together from the very beginning of every application. One of the things that we've done, uh, I implemented about six, seven years ago, I met with the head of the uh, project management office and the head of app dev and built in security into the initial uh, project proposal questionnaire. Anyone in, in the department that wanted to come up with a new solution for a, a great new tool, a great uh, addressing one of the missions of the department, um, they've got to fill out a questionnaire. Is this going to be internet facing? Is this going to be accessed by people? Is there going to be confidential information on it? Just a few of the questions that are related more to security than, uh, than on, on the business side. And business doesn't even think about this stuff. So um, in my meeting with the head of AppDev, I want to make sure that they are thinking about security in their SDLC to create a SSDLC. Um, not easy because we're probably all aware that developers, when they take their training in school, there's not enough security in there. So they're, they're taught, okay, I got a business requirement. I'm going to write this code. This is a great routine I just developed. I feel proud of this. But it's not secure, but they don't think in those terms. It's just not taught, and thus it's not in the forefront of their mind. There are some that are very diligent and say, hey, you know, I want to find the best way. But, but the vast majority that I've interacted with, not just public health, but a variety of places, is, I'm, oh, let me grab these libraries. These are cool. I, my friend just told me about this. Three quarters of the libraries that you will find are insecure. Just a fact. So it's definitely something. Um, OWASP will help with that, right? The uh, SAPI will ensure that secure libraries are being used. Uh, there are other free resources from OWASP. Um, I'm biased with OWASP. Ta -da. However, it is the de facto standard for a lot of the stuff for web developers to help them ensure security. Um, so um, if you're not familiar with OWASP and you're, you touch web the application development at all, either from the perspective of being a developer, a tester, uh, in the security side, or even if, as I mentioned earlier, there are third-party vendors that you deal with that have your data, you need to understand a bit about application security because how else are you going to assess them and whether they're a, a, a risk that you're willing to take. Uh, 10.30. Now, and I mean, now a whole other side of, 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 the, of your brain is going to be being used in privacy. Uh, we kind of take privacy for granted, but there's a lot of discussions around this country and, and with the GDRP in Europe about privacy and its importance and how America 
Everyone owns your data except for you, and in Europe, nobody owns it except for you. There's a big difference. Uh, so a privacy officer has a difficult job because they're going against the culture in America. But we, do, but we work together, right? HIPAA came out and the privacy rule was a little bit for the security rule. This goes back uh, to like, oh, oh, four or three years, I believe. And there's a lot of collaboration. Some of the privacy rules have some security requirements in them. There are other privacy rules that you should be aware of where you work. There's probably some type of privacy uh, guidelines for you. Every company has to have a privacy statement. You've seen them all. You've gotten the stuff in the mail if you want to opt out. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important this is. Quite often, we don't realize that we think in terms of security. security. But if the data gets out there, um, that, that's, a, that's a huge deal. And the cost, the potential cost to a company um, can be pretty high. I know that, for example, with the Office of Civil Rights, which manages HIPAA violations, the last five years they've really started enforcing their million dollar fines and more. Um, it's a risk that your company has to assess. And some companies, frankly, if they're big enough and if they're not regulated enough, might just say, well, this is an acceptable risk. I'm moving forward when we'll just get fined and versus the cost of, of a good security. I've seen it. Some of you are shaking your head. Yes. Good question. How many of you are familiar with cyber insurance? Yeah, it's, it's gaining. If I asked that question three, four years ago, probably have half the hands. The, all right, so here's the deal. Cyber insurance is starting to become a requirement to protect the an ongoing concern. Any company that wants to continue doing business, if they're large enough and they can absorb the costs, and some are, as I just mentioned, with the risk assessment aspect, but the majority, especially SMB, better look at some cyber insurance. But here's the problem with cyber insurance. A couple of problems. And anyone raise their hand if I miss something, please do. Um, thank you for raising the question. At any time, please feel free to, to ask something. That way I don't have to go through the whole slide deck. Um, so most, cy most breaches, most cyber incidents, the cyber insurance that you get usually isn't enough to cover it all. So there's going to be some out-of-pocket costs for every company. Think about your own insurance, health, life. These guys are very clever. They're the same people offering cyber insurance. It's another money-making operation. They, they know there's not a lot of competition for it yet. And they're experts at creating loopholes and creating areas where there's deductible, all kinds of things. Okay, that's one aspect. So you will not get enough coverage. The other aspect is, they will assess you initially. And if you're not practicing good security, then either you, your rate will go very high or they won't cover if there's a breach because they said, hey, you didn't do your part, you're not secure, we're not covering. Um, so things to think about when you're looking at a, at a cyber insurance provider, read the fine print. That's unfortunately the way it is. Yes? Amounts. There's one, okay, when do we start buying insurance? Because there's a certain amount every organization is willing to cover. It's like, if we lose 100K, well, we cover it. But if it's 5 million, we don't. But then the other point is, okay, what's the upper limit? It's right? like, okay, well, above that, we would be out of business, but it gets so expensive to cover that, that's not a good investment either. What I've seen work and used more and more is quantitative risk assessments, putting numbers to actual rather than uh, let's get 10 minutes because they sell you everything they don't care but the better idea you have okay what are the actual costs on one side with a quantified risk assessment and on the other side what are we willing to to cover in the case of an event that helps you to buy meaningful uh, insurance rather than just a, a blank of okay we cover this amount good, good points uh, one before I go to the next slide I want to just stress one really important thing which seems to still be misunderstood, it's getting better. Some people look at regulations, and if you meet your regulations, that's security. No, compliance and security are two totally, totally different things. We know security, the people in this room know security. The business side knows compliance, right? The, I've seen companies go to a CISO, throw them against the wall, not literally, and say, 
we, compli we passed our last PCI audit and we're compliant. How the hell did we get breached? <laughs> because compliance will not ensure your security. Yes, sir? Target was PCI compliant. Exactly. So don't make that mistake and don't let your upper management convince you that you don't have to make that spend because you're already compliant. Compliant is a checkbox and that will allow you to conduct business. You, PCI, you need that to conduct your credit card business. Yeah. It's not just a checkbox. I'm a guy. So it's a tool you, you use, right? It right. helps you, but absolutely. It's, it's one of the many things. Uh, it's one of the requirements. Uh, don't stop there. Right. Yes, I've been properly corrected. It's important, but that's not the total security package that you need. It's one thing. Thank you. How do you talk to the other C-suites and convince them when you talk about budgeting, what, what you need, risk assessment? Like, I find that when I talk, I consult a lot to other people in these positions like, like what you have, and a lot of times the, the struggles that they talk about is how they get their message across to the other people exactly. that are making decisions with them. And, and how they can convince them, like, no, like, if we don't do this, this is a problem. Like, this, this is a big risk area, but it's a small risk area, but when you talk technical, they just don't get it. I'm going to talk about that later, but just real quick, let me just, so I don't leave you hanging there, let me mention um, one of the things uh, that I do is I, I'm, I mentioned health insurance earlier. I'll, I'll talk to the upper management about health insurance. So I've done this in the past. Okay, I say, okay, you're in good health, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, I had a physical last week. I said, all right, so can, cancel your health insurance. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. I said, why? Why wouldn't you? You're in good, right? You got, you passed your PCI compliance. I mean, your 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 doctor's appointment. You're in good shape. You had your test. Your heart's good. Cancel your health insurance. No. Okay. Then why do you want me to cancel? Putting in good security. We're here, where we where we are right now. Why would why would you want me to do that? How's that any different? It's you and your family. Is this business important to you? I mean, maybe not in those words. Depending on who it is, they might get really pissed off. Don't tell me what to do. With. But you know, if you have. That's the type of message. Just try to relate it in their terms. All right? And I'll talk later on about you know, how to speak to the C-suite a little bit. Uh, some of the experiences I've had. That's a good question. Um, okay, so security awareness. You know, I touched on it earlier with the um, phishing attacks that we get. Uh, security awareness cannot be overstated. It's really important. It's a people issue because we do have a people problem. But it's not their fault. I mean, come on. There, where I am, I've got, I've got clinicians, I've got epidemiologists, I've got doctors, nurses, um, administrative people, and they, their focus is on their expertise, their role, right? They don't want to know about DAT files. They don't want to know about you know, how many attacks came through the firewall. They don't even want to know what a firewall does. But they have to know some basic rules of how to use the systems that we provide them. Basic, just basic. And that's what the security awareness is all about. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, don't click on the links, don't open attachments. Uh, you know, good luck getting 100% on that. But as Marco pointed out, there's many things that you can do in security and just because one thing isn't the answer all, you don't stop doing it. You have to do each of these things. AV catches what, 18% of the attacks? But don't pull your AV out. You can upgrade it, but that's another story. Um, so what we do is we'll have several events per year where we'll get a bunch of people in a room, and I'll bring in speakers from the FBI, Secret Service, District Attorney. I get the District Attorney regularly because I work in LA County, so that's, that's a nice thing. I'll give talks on a variety of subjects. Security is really wide and deep, so there's tons of things we could talk about. I try to make it personal. So in the advertisement that I send out in the email, also when I, uh, there's, a, there's a journal that's published in the department, and there's also a county-wide thing. So we'll try to publish articles in there, but we'll, we'll tell people with a, something like protect your kids online. Now, not everyone has kids, but they have friends or their aunts or uncles or something. So that's a compelling thing, because nobody wants a young kid to get their ID stolen or get cyber bullied. You know, how to shop safely online, how to, how to secure your smartphone. So we make it personal, and at first, when I started this, 12 years ago actually, upper management said, well, this isn't county, 
why you train, why do you expect people to come to these meetings and miss work for private stuff? I said, okay. Well, first of all, once I get him in the room, I lead off with, the, with county policy stuff. But then I turn it over to the speaker. So, but more importantly, they're not going to come that much if it's just, hey, unless it's mandatory and these aren't. So you have to want them to be there. And they want, they're going to need to want to be there as well. And they'll learn something that they can take home. And who knows, right? Maybe the next attack is coming through their home system as they come in through our, your systems. So if they're practicing a sanitary security policy at home, uh, that will indirectly potentially uh, help us out. Plus, if they're thinking more about security, it's in their brain. If it's part of that subconscious. It's a stream of consciousness as they do their job. So if they see something, you know, if they see somebody look going and clicking on a site, they go, hey, hey, what are you doing? And I've seen that, you know, as it just, you know, it happens. Uh, we're all, you know, teammates, basically, where you work. Hopefully there's a, there's a feeling that we're on the same team. People will help each other out. And so if it's in their mind, they'll come. Um, you know, I've published articles on, on identity theft, and there's something called medical identity theft, which is really tough because unlike ID theft, which Federal Trade Commission helps manage and help people recover with medical, it can take years. The, the, the mechanisms are just not there yet for that still. And I wrote an article just six, seven years ago on this. So it's difficult, so you've got to be careful. Imagine going to get a procedure and you're allergic to penicillin, but the person who got your ID and had a procedure done and they said, oh, no, I'm not allergic to penicillin, and now it's your turn, and they inject you with penicillin. I mean, it sounds far-fetched, but it's not. It happens. Stuff like that happens. So someone says, hey, I'm here for the surgery. He says, no, you had that surgery last year. I said, no, I didn't. Or you get billed for your insurance company for something that you didn't do, but it was someone using your ID. Um, 12.15, I've got to meet with, uh, with system admin and the, and the help desk team to be, uh, make sure that the change management module is in place. doesn't sound like security but it touches on it. Because if you don't have a change management process where you work, people make changes and all of a sudden something happens. So you've veered away from your standard image, you've veered away from your standard processes and you potentially opened up a back door. Because just somebody didn't know or they had a misperception or they had another idea about doing something else and maybe they implemented something really cool but forgot something else. So we have to have a formal process and everyone needs to have that. Lunchtime. I still have some bamboo stuck. Okay, next after lunch, we meet with the app dev team. All right, um, this is Im an important concept. Some people that I've spoken to, they'll take the good step of getting a uh, static security scanner. Okay, so um, that scans uncompiled source code. So what we've done, is we bought a tool and we set it up inside the development process. So when the developers check in code, it scans it and looks for potential vulnerabilities based on you know, its understanding of, of what was written and what is uh, liable to be able to take advantage of that code. Um, they then will make the corrections to it because it does give them links to sites on how to address that because again, they're not trained appropriately because most developers don't have the schooling that includes security. It's still a problem today, even though this has been an old topic. You have to spoken to people. Some schools are, are, are improving, and they're, they're baking it in a little bit, but it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. So we just want to make sure that, you know, ideally, I mean, it costs money, but make sure there's something going on that the developers can do. So to give you an example, uh, when we first started doing our dynamic scanning, which is done after the code is already compiled, and it's done by my team, security. We would scan apps before they can go live. We were finding medium and high risk vulnerabilities all over the place. We put in this static scanner, and then we start scanning, and there weren't high risk vulnerabilities. Now, of course, it took a little bit of time, but the, the developers were fixing it, and now, those of you in revenue-generated companies, like the county isn't, but there's still overhead, but those of you who work for companies that make money for a living, the cost to fix a bug in, during development 
is here. You know, Jim Attico has fancy graphs with numbers, but I'll just show you a nice little thing. The cost to fix a bug after it's already been written, you know, weeks ago, and on my security team scans it, is five times as much. So pay me now, pay me later, but the pay me now on pay me later portion is much, much higher. And so it more than covers uh, an investment in, in putting something in place. Okay, who gets calls from vendors? Now, vendors are part of my team. And I mean that as a, a general security team, not where I work, but we all need vendors. They have solutions that can help us. But my goodness, you know, when you go to events and you sign up or you get a, a great white paper or get a business card, I'm getting inundated with calls and emails. And one of the difficult things for all of us, probably I think this human species, is saying no in a polite way. So, I mean, if I call someone, I wouldn't want them hanging up on me, and I'm not advocating to hang up on them, but just go, hey, it's not in my budget. I'm working on other higher priorities right now. I love that concept. I wish I could, I had unlimited budget. I've got to prioritize. And you just have to be willing to say it. Now, decide on what your priorities are, and then look at the solutions that are potentially available based on your priorities. Right? So if you have a list of 10 things, then someone gives you a call about an 11th thing that you hadn't thought about, but you already did your risk assessment, it's just not, I don't have the time for it. Or if they call for number five, just coincidentally, and you're working on one and two as projects, and you've got three and four lined up, you might say, well, give me a call in six months, right? Because I'm just as, as pointless. Plus, technology changes so quickly, right? What you're putting in place today, in a year, you'll be looking at, okay, is this still relevant? Is, still a, is there a better solution? Uh, maybe if I buy this other tool that addresses these other issues I have, I'll combine it and, and, and reduce. I won't have to have three solutions. I'll just have one dashboard and one tool. So it's difficult to, I'm not saying blow someone off, but keep in mind that if you were to field all these calls, then you wouldn't have time to go to ShellCon. <laughs> so. 3.30, I have to meet with the system admin about uh, the network security vulnerability reports. All right, so everyone in this room, I'm sure your company is running network scanning. Uh, they're using some tool, right? Um, it's essential, essential. Um, but what we do is we compare our reports from our AV tool, our, um, our SCCM, I can name that product, which is our patch management tool from Microsoft System Center, uh, from our um, uh, network vulnerability tool, and from our AD objects in our exchange. And we look for exceptions. Are there systems that are in the network that are not showing up in the AV tool? Whoa, that means there's no AV on those systems. Are there systems without the SCCM client that are showing up on our network. That means they're not getting any patches, right? We also have a port control product which will only allow encrypted thumb drives to be used on systems. Um, and we also have um, encryption. Are there systems that don't have the encryption tool agent on them based on that the, the dashboard of that tool that are showing up in our network scanning or in AD as objects. That's a huge problem, particularly for us. If we get a laptop stolen, one of the first things we do is try to find out what that person did. Okay, is this a nurse? Oh, you're interviewing patients, you have, you have patient information on that laptop? Okay, is it encrypted? Okay, if it isn't, that's a breach. And, and with breaches, come the potential for fines and come the potential for notifications. Even if there's no fine, the cost for notifications can, can really skyrocket. You would be surprised. I mean, just think if you have a database with 500,000 records, multiply that by the, the time to try to track them down. You can't just mail a letter. You've got to make efforts to reach those people. So um, it's important to compare all these different reports and look for data after this correlation. And so we've been doing that for several years, and we open up help desk tickets, and then we say, okay, you're going to have to re-image or just push out the agent. 
Sometimes the agents will be pushed out initially, and for some reason, there's a glitch, it cracks out, you know, because we know that it, these are not infallible systems. No matter what your OS is, what, you know, what the device is, sometimes it doesn't finish installing properly. All right? Other times a person, you thought that they no longer had admin rights on their box, but they did something, you know, they removed a client. So um, it's important to make sure to check this out. 430. Okay, I talked about dynamic uh, security scanning. Um, Cross-site scripting, it's still there. Input validation problems, SQL injection, still there. This was discovered and, and a solution was put out there 10 years ago. It's still there. It's unbelievable. But with the proper tools and the proper scanning schedule, you can catch a lot of this. But let me just point out something that's crucial. Never, if you're in security, and if you're, in, you're an application developer here, you'll appreciate this, don't take the report, the big report, and, hear, and give it to your application development team. They'll look at this and go, are you crazy? And you'll lose their cooperation, you'll lose their respect, and they'll look at you as like, keep that person away. But if you take a little time to vet it yourself, look through it, boil it down to just a couple, of the, first, the high risk vulnerabilities, Second, make sure that there's no mitigating controls that you have in place already. Also, make sure that it applies to you, right? Because these tools are written for the generic company. You might have a totally different environment where a couple of these things were pointed out as issues, as high-risk vulnerabilities, but they're really not the way you work. It's just the, the, the structure that you have. So you've got to look at them, and then you can hand to them. But I would still recommend just a sit-down. When you have a report, sit down with, with some of the app dev folks and say, okay, Let's go through these. And then as you speak, they'll go, oh, you know what? But we don't use that. We have a library instead of this area that looks like a lack of, of discipline. We take care of it another way. And, okay. And so you discuss it, and then you hand it to them. Plus it has, same with the static scanning, it, it gives them links on how to fix it as well. So uh, be a teammate. Don't be a pusher of papers. Yeah. Give them access to the tool and the scans before you scan it to get rid of the whole shaming approach. If they have a chance to scan it and fix it before it ever gets to someone else, that helps tremendously with the acceptance. Um, because otherwise they'll be right in the defensive and you have your fancy dashboard and shame them into the ground of all the crappy coding. Because that's what you're doing. You're telling them what you're doing is wrong. You code like shit and you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and very few people like that. <laughs> Don't go to anyone and tell them their baby's ugly, right? Okay. Um, executive management. So I wanted to propose a web app that will have an internet front end. Okay, so where I work, doctors are uh, very creative people, very intelligent typically, and want to find solutions and they'll be on an airplane and read the, uh, the, the guy that's in the pocket or they'll talk to another doctor, hey, we're doing this great solution. But they never think about potential for breaches of security unless my security awareness is hitting them at the executive level, which is a challenge, right? So um, I've got to make sure that, as I spoke about earlier, right, where's the access coming from from this app? Is it internet? Um, what's the platform? Uh, who's going to use it? So make, make sure that you uh, try to get in there early on. Make sure that there's a culture where you work where anything that's proposed is run by security. First, first step, not just project management office, but security's in there because some things we just might shut down right away and go, okay, that's not going to work. How about, but, but have an alternative recommended, right? Because again, we don't want to be the cop, right? Security is not like physical security where we stop people. Our role is to help them do it the right way. Help them get their stuff out there, but make sure the security baked in. Budget, this is an issue. Um, we talked about, you know, you raised the question earlier about how do you talk to the C-suite. Um, I mentioned, again, build that culture. Let's try to get visibility with the top level folks. Um, too often, the security teams are buried low in the hierarchy and then they report to a, a CIO who reports to a, a head of a bureau who reports to the executive team. It's like, why the hell am I giving a title with a C in it if I'm two levels away from C and never talk to the C? And uh, we see this all too often. So uh, one of the goals, 
of the head of security in every organization is to have that time, that face time with the decision makers, the people with the scratch, who control the money, who control the budget, who understand risk. And our goal is to convince them of things. Uh, a public service announcement. At 6.30 I have a meeting about AppSec California, which is coming up. This is real. Uh, those of you who have never been there, it's at the Annenberg Beach House in January. Great talks, great sessions. Um, check it out, AppSec California. Um, some key parting concepts. Um, I have more slides on these. I'm not sure if I'll have time to get to all of them, but risk management is the most important. These are my big eight. All right? For those of you who follow sport, that's my big eight right here. These are the things that help make a successful CISO. Uh, they have these slides already. This is their laptop, so I'm sure you'll get them. Um, the large organizations get it. They know risk management. They have, they have a risk management team. As a matter of fact, there are some CISOs that report into risk management. My personal opinion, that's where we should be. Okay? Um, but risk management is at the top level of the company of the companies and they understand that risk is in pretty much in everything. I talked in one of the early slides about the risk that the assessments we do driving to work. And again, for the guys like you that don't. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, I believe risk management is the best place, but we see a hierarchy that's different in all different companies. I even spoke to a couple of people who have the CIO report to the CISO which is enlightened if you think about it. Because if a, you know, if a CISO reports to a CIO and the CISO is evaluating all the CIO's stuff and he runs it by him, you think he's gonna push it all up without filtering it? He's evaluated by the people up there. He's gonna push up, well here, here's all the things they found wrong about me. And it's, it's a bad model. It just doesn't work. Um, but we do the best we can with it. You build a good relationship with your CIO, you, you get him or her understanding the importance of the stuff you're doing, and then they might support you with a lot of the initiatives you want to do. So you're going to have to do the personality thing, bite your tongue sometimes, uh, but use your wits and, and just, you know, you can't just assume because it's merit and I'm doing the right thing that it will happen. It just doesn't work that way in the world. Enough of us have seen this happen with friends who were brilliant but they're not the, they're, they, they say the wrong things and, and the company says we don't want them they're like this guy's outstanding we see it in sports you got an idiot he's talking about stuff you know doing sit-ups in his garage but he's the best receiver of this decade and people don't want him so it's same in you know in work right um, CISO backgrounds come from a lot of different places most of us come up through IT not enough of us come up with web application background, um, and that's one of the biggest areas for potential risk, right? The way we, as you've seen in my talk that I've highlighted that a few times. Um, okay, once you get to this level, so much of it is about relationships. I mean, you've all probably experienced this to some extent already, who you know more than what you know. Um, I like to think it's both, right? But it's who you know and and how you present yourself, which is really important. Um, one of the things that I always do, uh, talking about the other direction, no matter what is happening to me, and sometimes my head hurts from getting hit so much from up above, I don't push that down. I keep my folks as happy as I possibly can. I treat them with respect, and I don't overload them with work. That's on me. If something's behind schedule, I might ask them, hey, you know, a little behind, and um, you know, if, if they feel respected, if they feel like I'm giving them opportunities, if I provide training for them, if I they bring them to conferences, um, if I listen to their ideas, if I switch their roles around, so now they get an opportunity to work in a different area that they weren't an expert in, but they can learn something else, then they'll feel that they're part of the team, and this is all really important. Uh, I never forget how I've been treated, and I have to treat the people below me the same way. Um, but find out wh who the key players are in all the different areas in the business units where you work because you can't just look at an org chart. You'll have one VP here who might run the whole show because the upper management, they just want to sign the checks and go home and play golf. You don't even know, and I've seen that. 
One of the biggest challenges, again, because most CISOs come from IT backgrounds, at this level, you're a business person, right? You got to give up a lot of the stuff you loved. My friends make fun of me because I'm technologically a moron now. I used to run networks. I was an IT director, but don't ask me to do anything. Some, I was going to a session last year. I had to bring a laptop. I'm like, how do I configure this? And the guy's laughing at me. It's like, well, I'm, I'm management. He goes, oh, OK. <laughs> So, but along those lines, on the business side, you've got to learn what all the business units do and who are the key people. Uh, most of us have some kind of regulatory requirements that we've got to follow. Make sure you, you follow that. Um, but the most important thing is know where your key information resides. Is there shadow IT going on? Are there, assist are there people throwing credit cards out to AWS to build their own little instances? Most likely, yes. Um, we're salespeople, we're PR people, okay? A lot of people in IT are introverts, so this is a challenge, right? You have to be able to sell yourself. Uh, many people ha have humility and we're modest and that's a, that's a desirable human trait, but we have to figure out how to make ourselves look important to the decision makers. It's the way it is human nature, right? Uh, it's hard, right? I don't want to go, hey, look how good my security program is, but when I present to upper management, that's what I have to do. Because if, if they think I have a shitty program, they're not going to fund it. So challenge there. Get yourself management training. If you're, at, if you're rising up into that level, don't just rest on your laurels. I'm a great technologist. You've got to learn how to be a manager. And that's, you know, you're, you're giving up your technical chops, right? But something's got to take up your time. It's this. So don't discount this. Yes? How big is your staff? How many, how many directs do you, how many direct reports do you have and then how big is the security staff? Okay, so um, where I am, I have 5,000 total people in the department. So I'm like an SMB basically. And um, although we're part of the county as a whole, um, I do not supervise the security ops people that manage the firewalls, right? But I do everything else that you've seen in this presentation. So I have four direct reports. That's it. That's my team. All right. So we've got our hands full. Um, so th this is important. I've got to wrap up. Uh, speak business ease. So you've got to learn the language of the business. The upper management, the executive team, C-suite, they do not care if you show them reports on how many times your firewall caught things, or what was stopped at the gateway. They couldn't care less. They don't care about your AV. They don't care about any tool. Don't mention tools. Just talk risk. Talk dollars, OK? By implementing this solution, I can save this because we don't have to do this and this, and people can now do this and this. Or I've enabled us to now access this information on the web securely, which saves so much effort and money well, now we're much, we, our, our clients are much happier because of this tool that I was able to talk to them at the highest level possible. Because A, they don't know anything you're talking about, and more importantly, they don't care. And if you keep doing it, they'll never invite you back. Thank you. Do we have, do we have time for a question or two? All right. Anyone else want to ask anything? Yes. Uh, which one? Which two? Oh, the static? Yeah. Okay. Again, this is not an endorsement. There's other solutions out there. I just happened to pick up Fortify, which is now HP. But that was like six years ago. So uh, I wouldn't go by anything I said. Because ch as I said, technology changes. You had something? Okay. If I'm doing security assessments and audits and they're doing compliance, let them have it. So they, they want to try to mix, like, how do you strategize against, you know, getting them to 
understand the differences between the two? Uh, first thing, invite them to go to lunch. Psychology, remember the salesmanship stuff that I talked about? Invite them to lunch, just talk about it, and say, hey, you know, it's great what you're doing. Uh, let me, let's team up because from my side of it, I have a lot more technical stuff that we're working on. We can work together and really protect the company. And, you know, I think it's, it's a win-win. I mean, you know, it's something off the top of my head. But the dialogue's important. Don't look at them as like, they're stealing my stuff. Look at them as like, okay, I'm gonna have to team with them. Yes, sir. Okay, so my background is a little different. I have a degree in, uh, in business, and I worked in business for a while. So I kind of meandered my way in. As a matter of fact, I used to be an architect, and I was a project manager running jobs. The, the building architect, not the security architect. <laughs> so, so you come in different ways. So I, I'm, you know, that, that's different for me. I had, that, I had that already. I was managing, when I was 25, I was managing 18 people already. So I had to learn kind of on the fly. Can I uh, recommend there are plenty of books uh, around uh, disciplines of execution, leadership styles, uh, leadership uh, frameworks out there that you can uh, choose to read from. Uh, and around, around risk management, there are also plenty of books there how to measure real estate as well. Thank you. Yeah, and, give you a few books, uh, and there are courses that you can sign up for in, in um, universities. I forgot the name, there were a few that some friends of mine have taken and they, they enjoyed them. Or you can get a master's if you have free time. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Good? Um, I just, this is kind of a pointed question because I've seen this in several organizations that I've worked with now. Um, you talked about how you, you know, one of the things you think about the most or keeps you up at night is fishing, right? Um, one of the things that I see in a lot of companies, like every company I've ever worked with, is that the policies that they teach people to implement to avoid, you know, clicking on a phishing email or something like that are the same, those same things that we tell people to signature or know that something's a phishing email are what they're using internally when they're sending messages to people from the company. Yeah. So like, hey, we need everybody to go through, go in and update this tax information, or we need everybody to go do this training, here's your link. Right? And it's it's very it makes it very easy for attackers. So I guess my question would be, what, if anything, are you doing to negate those kinds of practices? Because that's something at the higher level where people need to coordinate and I never see that happen or it just doesn't end up getting implemented yeah, if they do talk about it. Yeah, so just to paraphrase, you tell people don't click on links, don't open attachments, but if there's something you need them to do, you send an email with a link or an attachment. Yeah. What's a person to do? <laughs> right? So uh, it's, it's education. It's a tough one. It's a good question because I've grappled with that. And, um, you know, if we have one email that sends everything out, of course, there's email spoofing, IP spoofing, there's stuff like that. And so there's nothing that's foolproof, but there has to be some way to communicate with people. And so, you know, we basically just try to make sure that they do it. One of the other things that we do is we are using a tool that for every link, it's sent to the third party uh, that assesses that link. If it's a known malware site, they block it. Plus, they have a, we have a URL rewrite. So instead of just having a clickable link, it, it redirects it to that site. It adds some extra character. So it, it helps from that perspective. So there's, it's a combination of technical and procedural. Nothing's foolproof, though, right? We know, last statement, then I'm out of here. You can't secure your environment 100%. Impossible, right? If up management says, can you secure our system against attacks? We go, we could get close. But if you have good detection, good incident response, network segmentation, you minimize the damage. Thanks, everyone.